Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. It is an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful day outside for a baptism. We have a couple who are going to declare their commitment to Christ publicly in the baptism just outside. We bought ourselves a little rubber pool, which was the least expensive option. And it's the warmer option, too, other than going in the ocean in May. So thanks to Brother Carl for picking that up and tapping into the hot water this morning, <laughs> running it in a hose all the way out there. So that'll be good. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a great opportunity it is to be here today to worship you, Lord, and to say those words, it is well with my soul. And though the world seems to be falling apart and is unhinging, we know that you sit on the throne and nothing is a surprise to you. We pray that you might help us, Lord, to see you today, that as we look through your word and as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, that you might mold us anew, that we might become less of ourselves and more like you. Lord, I confess, we confess that we are not as we should be. There are things in our lives that you're still purging and still shaking out of our lives. And I thank you for your love in that you do that patiently with us. And I pray today, Lord, that you would speak to every heart. And Lord, you know the needs. I pray that you use your word and apply it to our hearts. So we give you this day, Lord, we give you ourselves. I pray that you might have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're back in Luke chapter 22. And we're still talking about Jesus' last meal. Uh, you'll know it as the Passover meal or the Last Supper. And uh, it's the last meal that Jesus eats before he goes and he sacrifices his life for us. So we've been looking at this last week. We saw what it was that he did. It was the Passover meal that he took and he broke the bread and he gave it to the disciples. And he began a new covenant with them and said, this is my body. Remember, it was unleavened bread. It was designed to be eaten quickly because it was celebrating the exodus of Israel from Egypt. And so it was designed to be quick so there was no leaven in it. Leaven is actually a contaminant. That bacteria that makes blood, the, the bread so nice and fluffy is actually a bacteria. And so there wasn't to be any of that. And Jesus is breaking the bread and sharing the cup, and he's giving a picture of what God intended long time ago for our deliverance to look like, and it only comes through Jesus, not necessarily through Moses. It was the Passover, and as the religious leaders were thinking about killing Jesus, this is a religious festival. They're supposed to be celebrating, uh, you know, the remembrance of being let out of captivity, and they were very expectant of a savior of who Jesus was among their midst and didn't even see. Passover, one of the big seven meals or the seven feasts in the Jewish calendar, and they're all there for you. The first four represent the first coming of Christ and the last three, his second coming, as we talked about last week. And as he did this, there was one sitting at the table who was Judas Iscariot. There are two Judases, Judas Iscariot. That's why he has a last name and no, not the other one. And he was plotting to turn Jesus in. It was the very act of a woman coming and anointing his feet. And in his estimation was a waste of so much money. And he didn't care about the money. He just cared about helping himself because he was the one who kept the wallet. He was the treasurer and he helped himself to it. But he had conspired and worked out an amount, 60 pieces of silver, which by the way, according to the Old Testament, is the price of buying a slave. 60 pieces of silver. The Passover 
And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. And so they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house in which he enters. And he'll, when you say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large furnished upper room and there make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. So these guys go on a mission and he takes two and he says, go out. And when you enter the city, you're going to see a guy carrying a pitcher. There's a lot of people carrying pitchers, but they're almost always women because that's women's work. Maybe not today, but back then it was the preparation of the home and the kitchen is what they were doing. And so they would be carrying these things. And to find a man doing that is unusual. And Jesus said, you'll know him because there's a guy carrying a pitcher, which is unusual. I mean, just this, these guys kind of, uh, you know, shadowing somebody and somebody looking over their shoulder. <laughs> Are you following me? When the hour had come, they sat down, the 12 apostles with him. They said to him, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. And I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus knew that this was his last meal. And he says, I've really looked forward to spending this time. And if you look in the book of John, it's got the most extensive amount of things that Jesus said. And John remembered them very well and puts them down. A lot of intimate conversation, especially once Judas left the room. The cups that were being passed are the four cups of the Passover uh, which are taken from the book of Exodus, representing uh, the, the various things that, that God did, their sanctification, their judgment, their redemption. And the last one is praise or joy. All of those having a representative of something in which Jesus didn't take the last cup because he says, this cup I'll drink when I get there. And that was very significant. Of course, it was unleavened bread, which is striped and pierced just exactly like the body of Jesus Christ. And long before we celebrated what we call the Last Supper, the matzahs were always striped and always pierced, perhaps not knowing why. And yet we understand why. And then, of course, the cup that he took, which is symbolic of his blood. There's no physical efficacy of the, the elements themselves. It has to do with a faith that's experienced in our heart as we take them. And so we looked at that. And of course, Jesus said there is the hand of the betrayer is with me on the table. Can't you imagine all of them kind of with their elbows and their hands on the table? And Jesus said, the hand of my betrayer is on the table. And they all kind of... <laughs> the last one is the rotten egg. But, and truly, the Son of Man goes, it has been determined. But woe to that man whom he has betrayed... When they began to question among themselves which of them it was and who would do this thing. I don't know if you've had 12 men in a room. Uh, men's discipleship, or I should say men's breakfast, can get argumentative at times. Now, there was also a dispute among them as to which one of them should be considered the greatest. They're always doing this. <laughs> Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And of course, all hands went off the table. And now he says, woe to you if it's you. And of course, they all say, is it me? If you read the other gospel accounts, they say, is it me, Lord? Is it me? And then, then they begin to defend themselves and say, not me, not me. And then they start accusing one another. Well, what do you know? And I can see the, the arguments that go on. And Jesus was so busy breaking up arguments, I think, what a tremendous failure on behalf of the disciples as Jesus is trying to speak to them and he's trying to teach them and he's trying to prepare them for what's about to happen. And he knows that he's going to be captured and he's going to be murdered up on a cross. And the only thing that they can do is try to defend themselves and try to demean one another and try to be the most important person in the room. And of course, the scripture tells us that we shouldn't do that. It's interesting because as you have debates and as people have conversation and there are disagreements, there are things that you find out that you don't find out any other way. Do you know that? Any of you married? A few of you are admitting it, okay. <laughs> when you're married and you have 
problems and you discuss it, there are all sorts of things that come out, right? If there's any unforgiveness, you know, someone will go back into the armory of, well, at least I didn't do this thing that you did. <laughs> now, I know you good people don't ever do that. <laughs> but you find out all sorts of things when you get in an argument. You find out really what somebody's thinking and what they're feeling, uh, unless you have somebody that just shuts off like a machine, and then they just, they just sit there and boil, but it'll come out. You wait long enough. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us this, in the following directives, I have no praise of you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. And then he says this, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. There is something in the conflict that shows if God approves of you or not. There's something in that mess that discloses things of the heart. And it's something that, and it's funny because they were all, he was writing to them about taking of the Lord's Supper, which is the very thing that we're talking about here. And those disagreements, they're essential, they're important because they bring things out that maybe otherwise wouldn't be heard or talked about. So it's one of those things that makes me go, hmm. So this week, that was just the recap for last week. And Jesus said to them, the kings and the Gentile exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. That's actually a title. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? And yet I'm among you as one who serves. Jesus demonstrating when they're arguing about who's the greatest and they're having this argument, Jesus says, listen, who's, who's more important, the person being served or the, the person serving? Well, in that culture, it was always a slave who brought you your food. Uh, not necessarily a slave like we understand it here in America, but somebody who was an indentured service, uh, who, who gave themselves for cash to be able to serve you. Uh, we would call that a servant. And Jesus says, who's more important? And he goes, and yet I'm choosing to take the service position. You guys don't be like the rest of the world who's groping for honor and titles and pats on the back and recognition. A any of you feel what I'm talking about? I mean, uh, isn't that why we buy a house that we can't afford and, and, and a car that uh, we can't park with everyone else? Isn't, isn't that why so many people are in this struggle? You know, the, the, the guy with the biggest toys wins sort of mentality. And Jesus said, that's not the kind of kingdom I'm setting up here, guys. And yet they're having argues, arguments over who's the greatest. And we know it's Muhammad Ali, so. <laughs> Jesus says, there should be no striving for titles, positions, or honor. It's not something that you should strive for. It's not something that you should look, you know, if, if I got a doctor's degree and I said, oh, by the way, I'm Dr. Dave now, okay? Don't call me Pastor Dave, because that tells me I have to be a servant. Call me Dr. Dave. You know, we have, we have a doctor here among us who doesn't insist to be called such. And I don't know if you remember Andrew, but when Andrew was among us, he was a doctor. He was retired. Did you even know? He was so humble and so down to earth, he didn't insist upon it. And I so appreciated that about him. There's no insisting on these positions, these titles or honor. Number two, be willing to take less than you believe that you're deserving of. Now this one's a little harder to swallow. He says you should be as the younger. I don't know if you know the culture, but in a situation where a father would die and he would leave his property to his sons, if he had two sons, the older would get two-thirds 
and the younger would only get one third of his estate. And so being the younger, not, not only are you in the shadow of the older, but you always get less. And that's what Jesus means. Be willing to take the low position and take less than what you think you deserve. Any of you have trouble with that? Like gas has gone up and the story goes, hey, listen, I went to the gas station and I got robbed. <laughs> Just like the rest of us. Are you willing to be content before God to take less than what you think you're deserving of? Or when somebody doesn't recognize you or somebody, somebody didn't say hello to me, they walk right by me. I think they're mad at me. What did I do? Be willing to take less than what you think you deserve. That's, that's a hard thing. Understand that there is no task beneath you, no need that you cannot fill. It's, it's like the piece of paper that I threw on the floor today. But you guys didn't know that. Threw it on the floor, it's still there. And everybody walked by it. Well, I'm not picking, I didn't do that. That's not my tissue. Maybe you didn't leave it there, but I bet you could pick it up. And Jesus was talking about that sort of a thing, about seeing needs and filling them and not waiting for someone else to take care of it. If we go to the book of John, John, the gospel of John tells us that it's at this moment that Jesus then takes off his outer garment and he wraps himself in a towel. And if that wasn't embarrassing enough, to see Jesus strip down to his skivvies and put on a towel and he filled a basin with water and he went around to the disciples. This is after they all ate at the table and he began to wash their feet. Stinky, dirty, men's, non-pedicured <laughs> feet walking in open-toe sandals on roads where donkeys and camels defecate. <laughs> and of course, these guys all have their feet in one another's face because it was more like a coffee table that they ate at, and they were reclined at a pillow on an elbow, and so your feet were in the next guy's face near his plate. And yet everyone came in, dropped down at the table, and just started eating. Nobody washed their feet. And Jesus said, I got to do a little show and tell here. The feast of Passover, and then Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, and he loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. He's putting their feet in his lap and drying them after washing them. I don't know if you've ever had somebody wash your feet after a pedicure, I'm okay, but it's a very humiliating thing to have somebody wash you. For me, it is. I'm, I'm a very prideful person. And then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Have you ever done that? And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him in his regular Simon Peter way, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he was bathed, needs only to wash his feet, 
but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Jesus washed all of the feet of all of the disciples, including Judas Iscariot. Can you imagine washing the feet of the man who is going to betray you for 60 pieces of silver and have you murdered? And Jesus comes to wash your feet. I can't imagine. And yet Jesus did that. Do you see how Jesus is in control of this whole situation? He knows what's going to happen. He knows how it's going to happen. He knows through whom it's going to happen. And he continues to teach and be more concerned about the disciples picking up what he's laying down than about his own life. And he gives Judas another opportunity to see grace and love so he might repent. And yet he doesn't. He's the one who made him the treasurer, which is incredible grace. If you knew somebody was a thief, would you let them watch your money? Jesus did. And he knew about it. And he let it be in hopes of a, lo a lesson being learned. Jesus is in control of all of this. And so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than the one who sent him. If you do these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus said, because I wash your feet, you guys should wash one another's feet. It's not talking about just the physical. If anybody's rude to you, can you forgive them? Wash their feet. Somebody said something that was unkind, can you let it go? Wash their feet. You know that somebody has a need that you can help with? Why not bless them? It's like washing their feet. And if you think about this, and Jesus said, you ought to do this for one another. I left you an example that you should follow. That means we should be looking for opportunities to do that. We should be checking each other's feet. Is there something I can help you with? Is there something that you need? And that, that's a Christ-like thing. That's a biblical Christianity. Amen. Back to the happenings. Verse 28, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom. They were arguing about who's the greatest. Jesus said, it's better that you're a servant. But by the way, there is a kingdom that's coming. Just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus said, there is a time coming when you will be judges of the 12 tribes of Israel. After Jesus said, make sure you're a servant of everyone. If you're going to be the greatest among men, you need to be the servant of all, Jesus said. And he says, there is a time coming when you're going to be in a position of authority. And I don't think people in positions of authority should ever be given them quickly without suffering as a servant. Would you say that's a pretty good idea? Somebody who learns to serve and learns how to help and learns how to become the low person on the totem pole, they know what it's like to lead well because they always do it in service of other people. I, I know too many stories of CEOs and those who are just full of themselves who have run a company into the ground because it was all about them and their profits. It wasn't about people. And Jesus was opposite. So he says, there is a time coming. In fact, we know from the book of Revelation, there are going to be 24 elders. Isn't it interesting? 24 is 12 times 2. You have 12 disciples in the New Testament. You have 12 tribes in the Old Testament. It's rather interesting. I see the Old Testament and I see the New Testament all laid out right in the book of Revelation. In Mark 8, 35, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
So Jesus stating this in another place in Mark chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 12, this is what it is to think ahead. And I think Jesus is helping them to see through the difficulty of right now so that they might see ahead of what's coming. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, by the way, those are those who have gone on before us and we can learn from, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, by the way, the joy set before him on the other side of the cross was you and me. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we are to take inspiration from what Christ has done and look ahead and look to what Jesus did because in this world, we're gonna have suffering. We're gonna have difficulty. But Jesus has overcome the world and he's assured us that we have a place. Jesus is always our best example. If you look to people, you always be disappointed. Have you found this to be the case? Any of you know me? I am a disappointment in many ways. Christ is always our best example. And the Lord said to Simon, Simon Peter, who didn't want his feet to be washed, and notice he doesn't call him Peter, he calls him Simon twice. Simon, Simon, indeed. Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. That's what we say in biblical jargon as a smackdown. Peter thought he was all that in a bag of chips. And Jesus said, Peter, you have no idea what you're talking about. And calls him Simon, which means vacillator. If you remember when he met him, he said, you shall be called Peter, which means rock. It means Rocky. Yo, he called him Rocky instead of Simon. And I think Peter was always trying to live up to that name. And so what he tells him is Simon, Simon, which means vacillator, men's men's, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. It's interesting when you do a word study of this. He says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you all. He's speaking to the disciples, but Peter's always the spokesperson. So he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you all that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, singular, Peter. Isn't that interesting? Satan wanted to sift. You know, when you take, when you take well, you don't take anything because you don't farm, but <laughs> when one takes grain, corn, anything out, it has to be separated from all the green nastiness that really you don't want to eat. And so it has to be separated. And there's an animal typically that would be dragging a sled that would mash all this down on a threshing floor. And the wheat would be separated from the chaff and all of the, the mess that's only good for starting fires. He said, Satan has asked me for you guys to see if your faith is real, to see if you guys are going to stick around. But what ends up happening with them? They all leave him and deny him three times. Peter's gonna deny him three times before the morning. And he tells him this. When Peter makes this giant boast, I'll never leave you, Lord. I'm a super Christian. No way. Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. Because by morning time, you're gonna deny me three times. This is Peter, who when all the other disciples in chapter 21 of John couldn't get a net of fish in because there were so many, he pushes them out of the way, says, move. And he takes it all himself and drags it onto shore. 
This guy's like a locomotive. He's not a little skinny guy. He's a big guy. And he gets things done. And he always says things. Sometimes right, sometimes wrong. But it's because he just had to say something. This is the same Peter who Jesus said, listen, I need you to go fishing for me. Peter's like, cool, you got your guy, I'm the fisherman. He says, throw in a line, and the first fish that you catch, there's going to be a coin in his mouth. Pop it out, because we've got to pay our taxes. And he does it. He goes fishing. He opens this, it's called St. Peter's fish now, if you go to Jerusalem. It's actually tilapia. And they have a strange thing of swallowing shiny things. So there's this coin. I wonder if Jesus, like, bing, you know, planted it earlier or if he just knew. This is Peter. Peter, who Jesus said, come to me, Peter, as he's walking on water, and Peter walks on water for a little while. So I, I imagine in the argument of who's greatest, Peter might be winning the argument. He's always there at the special occasions, the raising of Jairus' daughter, the Mount of Transfiguration. He always seems to be in the right place at the right time. And Peter thinks he's all that, and he thinks he's the greatest. And Jesus singles him out, and he says, it's a good thing I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith would not fail. And yet, by the time morning comes, you're going to deny me three times. I try, I try to think about being there. Jesus just said, the hand of my betrayer is at the table. And nobody suspects Judas at all. But now they think it's Peter because of what Jesus just said. You're going to deny me three times that you even know me, Peter. And it's interesting because it's just a servant girl by the fire as he was taken. And we'll look at that next week. And after he denies him the third time, there's the sound of a rooster crowing. Can you imagine how low Peter felt at that moment? And it says that he left and he wept bitterly because he denied the Lord that he said he was so committed to that he said, I'll give you everything, Lord. I'll, I'll commit my whole life to you. I'm willing to go to prison and die with you. And it didn't mean anything because he was all full of himself. We see a different Peter later on, the second chapter of Acts. He stands up and he preaches and 3,000 souls come to Christ and they come to faith in Jesus and then they get baptized immediately. And later on, there are 5,000 that come. So there are, Peter's a different man when the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he speaks with power. He takes the sword of the Spirit and speaks to people and does a much better job than trying to take a sword. And it's Peter who writes this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and to an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be relieved, uh, revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, listen, you guys might be having a hard time right now. I know what that's like. Peter had a hard time. He was accused in front of all of his brothers <laughs> that he would deny Jesus, and then he did. And he's somewhat separated from the disciples. And Jesus made it clear after his resurrection. He says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Why does Peter get special mention here? Because Peter has separated himself. He's too embarrassed to show his face. Because he's the guy that, you know, thumped his chest and made this big proclamation. And then he denied him three times. Go tell the disciples and Peter that I've risen. So he gets special mention. And Peter says, listen, for a little while, maybe you're grieved by various trials. But this is so that the genuineness of your faith, because he's being sifted. 
Satan has requested to sift you. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, Peter also says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial. By the way, that's how gold is refined, isn't it? The fiery trial in which is to try you as though some strange thing was happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Do you know when, when you suffer well, it gives God glory? And when we don't suffer well, we just complain and whine and cry and, you know, all that other kind of stuff. We do this because it's something that causes us to be more like Christ. We partake in his sufferings. And it says that Jesus learned obedience from the things he suffered. It's one of those very peculiar passages that Jesus learned. I mean, how do you teach God anything? But Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. And so do we. And it purifies our faith and it shows what we're really made of. In 1 Peter chapter 5, he writes this, Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Do you think Peter knows what he's talking about? You guys should all submit to one another. You should all be humble with each other. You should be gracious with one another. Why? Because he wasn't. He says, trust me, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So he tells us that we should be humble and accept whatever difficulties it is that we have in our life, knowing that it's from the hand of God and that he's using it to perfect us and to make us more like Christ. I don't know about you, but when I have hard times, when I have heartache, when things are difficult for me, I just try to pray it away. God, take this thing away. My car doesn't start, and I say, Lord, your car doesn't start. Can you start the car, please? But I've become accustomed to listening at times like that because the Lord wants to do something in the hardship and the difficulty. He wants to sift me and have the junk fall off so that the real thing and the real pure motives actually begin to come out and make us into something that we're not initially. It's the process of sifting. And then Jesus said to them, he's still at the Last Supper there, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. And he said to them, but now... He who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you, that which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. He knows he's going to die. And so they said, Lord, look here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. What a bunch of knuckleheads. Listen, Jesus said, remember before when I sent you out two by two to preach the gospel and I told you don't take anything, don't take another pair of sandals, don't take a jacket with you, don't take a lunch with you, don't take money, take nothing, just go. It's a tremendous amount of faith to trust that God's gonna provide for your needs as you go. And he said, did you lack anything? And they said, no, nothing, Lord, we, we had everything we needed. He goes, I'm, I'm changing my mind. Things are going to be different now because Jesus is going to go away. They've learned to trust the Lord for their needs, but now make sure you prepare. Make sure that you have a lunch with you. 
You got a sword? I like that. Any of you carrying a sword? Somewhere in my belt buckle or my shoe? I read that and I was like, yeah. I'm going to get, I have a right to bear arms. Jesus said so. Short sleeves. And that's what, that's what we think, you know, at least that's what I think when I read it. And he says, if you don't have a sword, get one. What's that all about? Jesus is saying, listen, while you're with me, everything's fine, I'll take care of your needs, but you know what, I'm going away. And you're gonna be on your own. And I'm trusting that you're gonna do your part in preparing. It says that we should always be ready to give a reason to anyone who asks for the reason for hope that's in us. It says that we should be ready with that word. It says we should also be ready with the physical needs that we're not gonna be a burden on other people. Because if you give away everything you have, that means you're a burden on somebody else. Isn't that right? So Jesus takes a shift here in ministry. He says, earlier I set you out and you had to learn to trust. Now, prepare. Learn to prepare. Make sure you've got some food. Make sure you've got the, the clothes on your back, an extra pair of sandals maybe, and make sure you have a sword. A sword? Well, it's interesting because there's going to be a sword used for the wrong reason in just a little bit. It's easy to take God's words and get them twisted and use them to our own devices. But from then on, all of Christianity in history shows Peter with a sword. You'll find it in stained glass. You'll find it in etchings. You'll find it everywhere. Peter is always the guy with the sword now because of what's about to happen. And Peter's definitely a prepper. And he's the guy who's getting everything ready. And from now on, he's going to be known as this guy, like the, the Boy Scout of the group. But Jesus says, take a sword. Because these guys would go until it was night and they would crash somewhere and they might be sleeping outside. Their outer garment acted like a sleeping bag. So they'd pop up the hoodie and they'd curl up in the corner and they'd fall asleep. I don't know if you've ever done that, but there are things larger than a mosquito that would bother you. So I believe it's for self-defense, but not against human beings, probably animals. Verse 39, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. We know from the other gospels, Jesus gives them this pep talk and says, listen, pray with me. These are my last hours. Pray with me, guys, and pray that you don't fall into temptation. They're probably like, what? With, with all of us, we're all the greatest. Come on, you kidding me? And then he takes Peter, James, and John, the three that were closest to him, and he takes them a little bit further and gives them the same charge. And he goes off a stone's throw away. So there's this outer circle of disciples, there's the inner circle of disciples, and then there's Jesus praying in the garden. And he asked them to stay up and pray. It's interesting because to get from Jerusalem, from the temple where they were, and to go down from the upper room and go down, they have to go through the Kidron Valley. At this point in time, the Kidron Valley is running red with blood because up in the temple, they're doing sacrifices. And that blood goes right into the Kidron Valley. And here Jesus is having to walk over this bloody stream walking over to Gethsemane, which means the, the, the olive press, the place where the olives are squeezed out so they get olive oil out of them. And it's the very place where Jesus is going to get wrung out. And it's where he's going to get captured. In Psalm 23, David writes, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It gives kind of a new meaning to Psalm 23 as Jesus went through that Kidron Valley. I wonder if he was thinking about Psalm 23. And so Jesus then knelt down and he begins to pray. And you may have seen all of the photographs or supposed drawings of Jesus praying. And of course, he's got a halo, so you know it's him. Because, you know, you wouldn't know who he was if it wasn't for the halo. And Jesus then prays 
and he's a little bit off from the disciples. We know that he does this three times, and it's significant because Peter's going to deny him three times, and he's going to have to wake them up three times. It's just a really interesting thing as you see all these things coincide. And as Jesus was praying, he was saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. In other words, I don't want to die. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Jesus said the same thing again. We know that he does this three times. And they were sleeping because they were so sorrowful. They were so brokenhearted. They couldn't keep their eyes open. And Jesus said, it's important that you stay up to pray. I don't know about you, but if you ever have trouble at night sleeping, prayer is like Somonex. It just seems to be that prayer and sleep work together. Have you ever found this? Two o'clock in the morning, you wake up and it's like, boink, your eyes are wide open. You start thinking about people you have to pray for and you begin to pray, you're out. You'll be right out, trust me. In fact, that might be the very reason the Lord woke you up. And it says that an angel appeared to him from heaven. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, in this time of his agony, his friends fall asleep and he's all alone. And the father sends an angel to encourage him. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever been there? The Lord will send someone and encourage you. So you don't have to worry about being alone. And we need that. We need one another. Have you noticed? We need one another. And it says that he began to sweat like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This is called hematidrosis. It refers to the occurrence of bleeding from the body surface produced by strenuous exertion or intense stress. The very, very small little capillaries in your, in your sweat glands actually burst from pressure and sweat mingled with blood actually comes out of your pores. It's actually a real condition. And there are people who can cry tears. They have a, a special condition. Um, it's called something that's very long. I can't pronounce, so I didn't put it up. But Jesus is under this, I mean, have you ever sweat in prayer? <laughs> have you ever bled in prayer? It's kind of interesting. In Hebrews 12, it says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, meaning Jesus, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. For you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Isn't it interesting it wasn't just on the cross where he shed his blood. He shed his blood in prayer in Gethsemane. I just find that very interesting. I don't know about you, but I have not prayed to a place where I was praying that God would do something that I know he wasn't going to do, just expressing my heart and then saying, Lord, your will be done, and sweat, no less sweat, blood. And Jesus did that, and he did that for you and me. And without that but in that sentence, we would be in deep stuff. Because the only way for us to be forgiven for our sinfulness, not just our sins, you know, the things we've done wrong, but our sinfulness, this ongoing degradation of our hearts and our minds, the only way we can get set free from any of that and set free from the guilt of it and the power of it is to accept Christ as our savior and have a new birth which you're going to be celebrating in a few moments for a couple of people who are going to take the plunge. And they're going down. <laughs> Amen. 
when he rose up from prayer and he had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Why do you sleep? As we go through the scriptures, you're going to see multiple disappointments and an exhibition of the faithlessness of human beings. You see the disciples arguing over who's the greatest when Jesus is talking about himself dying. They're they're wrestling over who's going to take over or divide his stuff. I, I have no idea. You see Judas, the failure of Judas to hold the line, and he gives him up for 60 pieces of silver. You see, the the failure of the religious system to recognize that Jesus is who he said he was. You see, the failure of Peter to recognize his own sinfulness and say, Lord, help me that I don't fail you. Help me that I don't deny you three times. And now he asks them to pray with him and pray that you don't get tempted, and he comes and he finds them asleep. I mean, disappointment after disappointment relying upon the faithfulness of people. Have you ever been disappointed in the faithfulness of people? Jesus more so. And yet, he still loves you, and he still died for you, and he still shed his blood for you so that you might have a new life with him. I think that's absolutely amazing testimony of his love. I'm going to leave it right there for today, guys, and we'll pick it up next week. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And who's getting baptized today? Can, can I see your hand? Can you stand up? These two young men right here in the back have given their lives to Jesus Christ. And they're going to declare it by being baptized right out here on the front lawn with no shame. Well, (laughs) maybe some. Guys, I'm going to excuse you right now so that you can go and get dressed if you need to do that. And uh, your stuff's in my office, brother. So, Trying to be efficient about use of time because we want to have food and we want to see these guys get baptized and I don't want to lose any time in between. Immediately at the end of the song, if you guys would just gather up and get whatever it is you need to, go out these doors and go around. Um, It's probably better for you to go right through this door. I'm sorry, Dino. Your protected space will be invaded by a long line of people. We'll go right out that door, hook a left, and the baptism pool is right out there. If you guys can just wait for a couple minutes, um, we'll get it together. Okay? Is that okay? Is that all right with you guys? Yes. Yeah, I'm talking to you. I'll I'll talk to you. I say yes. Good. Pray with me just for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, what a tremendous privilege it is to know you. And to know that you sent your son to be an example, to be a teacher, and to be a sacrifice. Because all of the things that we do and the brokenness that we have, there is no repair for except for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that we're here today. And within the hearing of my voice, those who have heard your word, I pray that it goes down into their hearts that it motivates them to be like you. Help me, Lord, to be a good example of who you are. Help us, as we are sifted, that we might release the impurities and become more like you. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, what we do here today, we do for you, Lord. Amen. I'll go. All right. You ready?
We're consulting the ducky. <laughs> no, tell me your name. Give me your testimony, brother. My name is Noah. Um, so I'm dedicating my life to Christ because before I came to Him, I just could never, uh, could never find happiness. Um, I'm selfish. Um, just filled with anger and bitterness. Um, everything I've been through and. Uh, he knew it, you know, and uh, I had no hope, you know, and I knew he was my last thing I'd go to, so I did, and he convicted me of all this stuff, and he told me he loved me, and there's nothing, not a greater feeling than that. That's, a, that's pretty much my testimony, and he's just working in my life, and he's changing my heart from the inside out, you know, slowly but surely, you know, and I just keep my faith in him, and that's it. That's it. All right. You can put you can put one hand over your nose and we go down and put your other hand on your wrist. We need something to hold on to. Noah, according to your testimony about Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 now I'm here to just give my um, confession that I've accepted Jesus Christ into my heart and uh, he's my savior and um, basically my many testimony is that I um, grew up in a very um, definitely in a Christ-centered household very basic um, and but and I, I did was raised in the church went the youth group all that um, but uh, it really didn't was I was not as focused in it as I am now and I really just kind of was like okay I know that God is he's, he's he exists but I really didn't take that all kind of stuff seriously um, but as time as I eventually moved to this area and just kind of moving myself away from people that didn't really help me to become closer to Christ, I just finally, um, not turn my life around, but turn, put it in the right direction where I'm actually able to focus on Jesus and his love for me. And yeah, that is my testimony. <laughs> with your testimony about Jesus Christ and his salvation in your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Right on. <laughs> <laughs>